Kentucky presenting our upcoming exhibition, Sonia Clark, Tatter, Bristle and Mend. I am Christina Knowles, the museum's director of development, annual giving and membership. I really wanna thank you all for your commitment to women in and through the arts and for your generous support of the museum. Whether you have been with NIMWA since its founding or are new to our community, you are an important part of our museum family. Every single day, we are truly appreciative that you have chosen to support the National Museum of Women in the Arts. We also extend our sincere gratitude to the Sonia Clark exhibition funders, the Kobe Foundation, with additional support from the Share Fund, Clara M. Lovett, the Sue J. Henry and Carter G. Phillips Exhibition Fund, Stephanie Sale, and the Lenore G. Tawney Foundation. As many of you know, the museum has been temporarily closed since before Thanksgiving. We are delighted to reopen to members on March 2nd and to the public on March 3rd, celebrating Women's History Month, one of our favorite months of the year, with a host of virtual programs and presenting two new exhibitions Sonia Clark, Tatter, Bristle, and Mend, and Mary Ellen Mark, Girlhood. On March 8th, we will host an all-day virtual International Women's Day celebration. So I hope you'll all look for your member e-news next week to see a full listing of the exciting programs we have planned throughout the month. Today, my colleague Katie Watt, Deputy Director for Art and Programs and Chief Curator, is presenting the works and themes in Sonia Clark, Tatter, Bristle, and Mend. Katie has led the museum's curatorial vision for 12 years. As she oversees the museum's exhibition program and the development of the collection, Katie says that she always thinks about how do we evolve conventional ideas about women artists. Her greatest joy as a curator is to be surprised by an artwork, captivated by its scale materials, technique, or intent. The works in Tatter, Bristle, and Mend certainly fit the bill. The exhibition has been long in the making and delayed by the pandemic. So we are pleased to finally present this compelling exhibition, which is the first survey of Clark's 25-year career. A little housekeeping before we get started. Due to the number of guests today, everyone will be muted and not visible. We invite you to post your questions and comments in the chat box as we go along and look forward to answering them at the end of Katie's presentation. As an aside, in preparing for the program, we learned that Katie hates coffee. So for Katie, I raise my cuppa and pass the mic. Thank you so much, Christina. And everyone, that's why I pulled a face at the beginning because um, this wonderful, fun series, Coffee With, that um, Christina and her team have developed is terrific, but I do hate coffee. So I, I, I do balk at the title, but thank you again for, for joining us. I'm gonna share my screen and get started. Okay, I hope everyone can see a beautiful picture of Sonia Clark standing in her studio in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, we are just days away, as Christina said, from opening our new exhibition, Sonia Clark, Tatter, Bristle, and Mend. And it's my pleasure to offer this brief preview um, of this project. As I said, this is Sonia. She's in her studio here, one of her two studios in Amherst, Massachusetts, where she transforms everyday materials into artworks that honor her ancestors and reveal social injustice. Um, we recently installed a work from our collection um, by Sonia called Afro Abe II in our collection galleries. And it's a really tiny piece. And I worried when we put it in that our visitors would somehow miss it as they were sort of moving through the gallery. But I have to tell you that everyone, everyone who enters that gallery finds that work. And we'll return to Mr. Lincoln in just a moment. Sonia Clark is the daughter of a psychiatrist from Trinidad and a nurse from Jamaica. So of course, ancestors on both sides of her family were brought to, excuse me, were brought from Western Africa 
to the Caribbean by the transatlantic slave trade. And Clark's father was uh, most likely descended from the Yoruba people for whom the head is the seat of a force or a strength called Ashe. So some of Sonia's earliest works are headpieces. Um, in her wig series, and I'm gonna show you a succession of, of works from that series, she stitched black embroidery thread through, I guess what I would call skull caps, and then styled those long strands of thread as if they were hair. So here's 21 with Bantu knots, those coiled twists that are inspired by hairstyling traditions uh, among the Zulu people in South Africa. Here's spider, which has these curling braids and of course eight of them, like the number of spider's legs. And fingers with five really tight pointy twists. Triad with three chunky braids. Hemi, obviously a play on the word hemisphere with two halves. And my personal favorite, Unum, with just one spirited twist. Sonia says that what's on the outside of a person's head often expresses what's on the inside. And for me, when I look at this piece, the style communicates kind of a, a spunky, independent mood, whereas something like Crown, which she made around the same time, I think you can see it conveys sort of a more regal, serene persona. And here's a lovely detail shot of the top of that work to show her gorgeous stitching and braiding techniques. Clark is trained as a textile artist. She graduated from Amherst College where she is now a professor. She later attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and Cranbrook Academy of Art. So from these early headpieces from the late 90s, she continued to explore hairstyling, which she sees as a primordial textile or fiber art. If you think about it, hairstylists are dealing with hair fibers, right? They're working them. Um, in an artistic way. And so she points out too that hairstyling is not about vanity. It's about ritual. It's about extending pattern and styles and traditions through time. So for a work titled Haircraft Project, Clark asked 11 hairstylists to create new styles for her hair. And I'm showing you just three of the large scale photographs that are in the show. We have 11 total um, and in each of the photographs, Sonia is at the right, showing us the back of her head, and her collaborators are on the left facing us. So these are the women who designed the hairstyles that you see. And Sonia talks about sort of being a walking art gallery as she would get this succession of hairstyles from each of these women, and then um, uh, sort of live her life in Richmond, Virginia, where she was living at the time. Some of Sonia's uh, hair themed artworks are made from actual human hair. So to create this work skein, which I think I'm gonna say the, the ball is about maybe four, four and a half inches across, she felted together 80,000 strands of hair to make that hair yarn. And each hair stands for the 80,000 people transported from Africa to the Americas each year at the height of the slave trade. And you know, this is the essence of Sonia's art. She creates a visual representation of a fact or an idea from our history that is difficult to grasp. And I actually helped install this work last week. And as I stood there holding it in my gloved hands, um, I was surprised by how heavy it was. I think I thought it's hair, it's gonna be light, it's gonna be fluffy. But at 80,000, um, that the number of hairs, it, it really had a lot of weight. And it, I began to feel sort of in that moment in my body physically, uh, the magnitude of the number of people, that number of people pulled into slavery. So Clark sees hair as an ancestral legacy because every strand of hair on our head contains our entire DNA sequence, a sequence that extends directly from our ancestors. And so hair is therefore very, very precious. This exhibition features stunning necklaces made from hair. So you see this one um, called Hair Necklace Five Branches where the strands are bound um, and shaped by wire. It's reminiscent of tree branches. It could be something like a family tree. Are there strands of pearls maybe that have been passed down lovingly in your family? Well, here are Sonia's pearls. The message here being that in place of gemstones, hair is a beautiful adornment worthy of being passed down through the generations. This piece uh, hangs on the wall about I'm going to say it's a little more than three feet. So these are mega pearls. These are really, really impressive. 
this tiny wood dish, this is only about, I'm gonna say three inches across at most, holds a hand formed from Clark's own dark hair. So she felted her own hairs into this hand shape. And in the center of the palm is a pearl, which she made from her mother's white hair. So the title, Pearl of Mother, makes clear that Clark sees her mother as the embodiment of wisdom. So Pearl of Mother, Pearl of Wisdom, right? But it's the visual here, the delicate hand, it's only about two inches, uh, cr gently cradling that tiny ball of white hair. For me, that, that really sort of puts the lump uh, in my throat, the visual there. Sonia Clark is also very well known for her sculptures made from pocket combs. Our culture perpetuates all kinds of ideas about good hair and bad hair, manageable hair and unruly hair. And let's be honest, those categories often relate to gender and they relate to ethnicity and to race. Clark makes sculptures from these black fine toothed pocket combs precisely because of hair politics because this common everyday tool is unusable on her own textured hair. So this glorious 12 foot long sculpture made from hundreds of combs unfurls off the wall into our galleries like a bolt of cloth. And you can see on the right in the detail how Clark conjoined the combs to create patterns. So for me, this work resembles a Scottish tartan, right? Like a plaid, um, a bolt of cloth. And Clark does have some Scottish ancestry, which she can trace back quite a ways. On that note, this comb sculpture looks like a family tree, right? But what's different here? Think about what a family tree typically looks like if you've seen one drawn out, what's different here? Well, you can see how thickly the combs, excuse me, how thickly the combs are stacked up along the edge of those branches. So the tree is deep and it's rich, but it's, it's truncated, it's sheared off. It's unable to extend out further. And again, this is Clark's representation of the phenomenon of people being unable to trace their family roots in Africa because that lineage was severed by the slave trade. Clark also uses combs like a loom for weaving. She wraps thread between the teeth and around the spines of these plastic combs, and then she stacks and binds the combs together. So this is a detail from this work, Kente Comb Cloth, which she made by wrapping threads around combs, arranging them in squares, and then placing them alongside plain combs, squares of made from uh, plain combs to approximate the geometric patterns of Ghanaian Kente Cloth. Here is Sonia's pocket comb tapestry depicting Madame C.J. Walker, and I've included a shot of the gallery goer here just to make clear the exceptional scale of this work, which is the first thing visitors see when they enter the galleries here at NIMWA. You may be thinking, how in the world does Sonia render the details of Walker's face using combs? Well, she painstakingly clips out individual teeth from more than, in this case, more than 3,000 combs and then join them together to create areas of light and shade. So if you're looking at those individual squares within that detail, each of those squares is made from two, three, four, eight combs. And so she's clipping out the teeth from each comb or not in order to create areas of light and dark. And the detail is from um, a section, if you look to the larger image on the right, it's from right around the bottom of Madame C.J. Walker's nose and her upper lip. If you don't know her, Madame C.J. Walker was the first self-made millionaires in the United States, renowned for developing and marketing hair care products for black hair. In another work about Madame C.J. Walker, based on a different photograph of her, Clark wrapped each spine of 42 pocket combs with thread, changing out the colors, right, every sort of few millimeters um, or partial inch in order to create those subtle gradations of tone across the spines. And then she stacked them and join the combs to form this portrait. This image is so deceiving. It is maybe four and a half by four and a half inches on the wall. It's this tiny little gleaming gem um, that is just so, so gorgeous. Clark also weaves together glass beads. These are itty bitty seed beads, tiny, tiny, if you know beads. And this hand reaching up expresses Sonia's yearning to reach back through history. 
um, her appreciation for something handed down from her ancestors. So it's quite figurative. And I wanna say something about Sonia's materials uh, and her process here. The mediums are pretty simple. It's just, think about what we've looked at so far. It's just thread, right? It's just hair. It's just pocket combs, the types of things that we have around us all day, every day. But her process and her imagery transmute these simple materials into a gut punch. So this form looks deceptively simple in PowerPoint, in person, even in our exhibition catalog. You can see the, the gleam of the beads, the density and the weight of those concentric rows, and then the delicacy, the fragility of those single seed beaded fingers reaching, reaching up. The work is, in a word for me, just jolting. This glorious beaded panel depicts South African artist Esther Malangu painting a mural inside the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond when Sonia Clark was teaching at a Virginia Commonwealth University, which is just next door. VMFA commissioned Malangu, who is uh, part of the Ndebele uh, community in South Africa, to paint the walls entering their African art galleries. And Sonia worked with her students to create this response in beads to Malangu's painting. Clark is very conscious of artistic legacies too. And she draws a lot of inspiration from black visual artists, musicians, writers. Do please note though, uh, how the beads around the tip of Malangu's brush radiate out in circles. I hope you can all see that. Uh, to be able to do this, to be this expressive in beads takes your breath away. Um, quite, quite gorgeous. All right, is everybody ready for a short sidebar? With all love and respect to our wonderful colleagues at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, NIMWA, our museum, worked with Esther Malangu two decades before the VMFA did. She created a mural on the exterior of our museum's building in 1994. And here is the unveiling ceremony. So you see her finished mural in the deep to the small shot to the left. And in the larger photo, you see our, our museum's founder, Wilhelmina Holiday, in a beige jacket at the right, and we'll let you find her. She's standing next to the artist, Malangu, and at the podium, oh yes, that is Dr. Maya Angelo, the event's featured speaker. So this is my little, little commercial break to give a cheer to Nimmo for often being ahead of the curve. Clark's recent works lean more toward broader social justice issues related to the Black experience. And to make these works, she's embracing more varied materials, including currency, as you see here, flags, gold, and sugar. And so we now return to Afrowave 2, which is kind of a bridge between the hair-focused personal works that preceded it and Clark's more recent political content. I'm pretty sure the first time you saw this Afro embroidered onto Abraham Lincoln's head, you had a startled reaction. But think about what you now know about Sonia and hair. Hair is glory and hair is a link between people. Clark made Afroave around the time that Barack Obama became the first black president of the United States. And she points out that without Abraham Lincoln, without his Emancipation Proclamation, there would never be a President Obama. And allow me to quote Sonia directly on why she created this work, why she created Afroabe. First, she says, Lincoln looks much better with an Afro. Second, it's crowning the emancipator with the hair most associated with black liberation and black power. And of course, I blew my punchline, which was this next slide, um, Afroabe progression, which is uh, in the collection of a very lucky private collector uh, just to say that uh, in Sonia Clark's hands, Lincoln's hair glory knows no bounds. An artwork that shows that through line from President Lincoln to President Obama, even more explicitly is this large scale print depicting our 44th president. And I think you pr can probably see that it's pixelated. So what do you think those dots might be? Uh, you probably guessed it. They are digital scans of the one cent coin, the penny, which shows Lincoln in profile. And so here Clark's brought together again, these two Illinois statesmen joined by history. But I wanna be clear, Clark is not sentimental about Lincoln 
or anything really in her work. She is well aware of the complexity of human character, the good and the bad. Gold Coast Journey is a carved ebony wood spool that Clark wrapped with a thread made from 18 karat gold. That gold thread measures 5,242 inches in length. There are 5,242 miles between the west coast of Africa and Richmond, Virginia, where Clark lived for many years. So this long, long thread of gold marks figuratively how far millions of ancestors were forced to travel into slavery, away from their home, away from everything they knew. In 2010, the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia proclaimed April to be Confederate History Month in the state and his proclamation contained no mention whatsoever of slavery. And so Clark was motivated to begin to work with the image of the Confederate battle flag. Her unraveling is a performance piece in which she stands shoulder to shoulder with participants and together they remove individual threads from a flag and they talk together about the work that they're doing. So that is Sonia on the right and a participant on the left. And these conversations that she has with the people who, who participate in this performance with her and the process, the handwork, the labor of their, of their, their work and sort of very painstakingly pulling individual threads, which is tough to do in a tightly woven cotton flag like this, sort of symbolizes for her the hard work that's needed to undo, to unravel the racial trauma in the United States. More recently, Clark's been creating works about this Civil War flag. Have you seen this before? Because I sure hadn't before I started working with Sonia. This is the flag of truce. And it's actually a dish towel that Confederate troops at Appomattox waved in surrender on April 9th, 1865, ending finally the American Civil War. So the Smithsonian has this big portion of the, of the dishcloth flag, about half of it, and Sonia has studied that. She also knows this tiny fragment of the same flag at Appomattox Courthouse National Park, where it is displayed in the plexiglass case. And this is my personal, personal shot from a visit, so I'm sorry for the quality of the image. And Clark's abiding question for us is, while we all certainly know the Confederate battle flag, why don't any of us know this flag that symbolizes a moment of resolution and peace for this nation? And thinking of that small fragment that's at Appomattox, Clark wanted to interpret it in a way that would make clear how present the flag of truce should be in our national psyche. So she rewove it at 10 times scale. And you can see here on the left, again, her tremendous weaving skills. And I do mean 10 times scale. It's uh, 50 by 30 inches. The original fragment at Appomattox is five by three. And by rendering that fragment this big, she makes us feel the flag of truce's importance, feel its promise. Remember that Sonia's parents were born in the Caribbean? Well, sugar is the reason that her ancestors ended up there. From the 16th century, the Caribbean, you probably know this, the Caribbean filled with European owned sugarcane plantations and sugar processing facilities that required a lot of labor. And people from Africa were enslaved there for the sake of sugar. This is my last image today. Cotton candy flower, a sculpture made from dried cotton burr. That's the part of the plant that's sort of left behind after the cotton bowl is picked out. And flowers made from sugar. There is no denying it. This sculpture looks beautiful. I just saw it this morning. We unpacked it. It's stunning. The textures, the colors are appealing. Sugar is delicious, right? But cotton and sugar each have an inhumane history that is largely invisible to us. And that's what Sonia Clark does. She manifests powerfully the things that we as humans must think about, family, justice, and truth. It's been a joy to be with you 
today and I thank you for listening. The exhibition, as Christina mentioned, opens a week from today to the public on March 3rd. The catalog for this show is available if you want to learn more about Sonia and see all 100 works of art in the show. That's one way to do it. And finally, listening to me prattle on about Sonia's art cannot compare to hearing her speak about it. That is a transcendent experience. And she will participate in a virtual Nimmo Fresh Talk on Sunday, April 18, from 5 to 6 p.m. So please mark your calendar and watch our website for more details. Again, this will be a virtual event. So wherever you are, you are welcome to join us. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, we have one question so far from Kay. She is interested to know uh, what felted means. Felted, so um, thank you for your question, Kay. Uh, felting, for those of you who um, have, I'm, I'm a needle worker, so I can answer this pretty easily, which I'm happy about. Um, any kind of um, hair, um, whether it's a human hair or an, an, another kind of animal hair, has little sort of scales on it. And when you sort of smash hairs together, those scales click together and um, and sort of form a whole cloth. And that's kind of, um, that's felting. So when you take wool and do that, that's how you make sort of wool felt. And it's the same with hair. So Sonia was sort of taking these hairs and probably using a needle tool to sort of mash the hairs together to felt them, to get them to stick and hook together. Um, it, comes out looking like a dreadlock and a dreadlock I think is sort of made in the same way sort of with a little bit of friction pulling the hairs together so that they hang together um, to form that sort of one unified cord if you will. Wonderful. I, I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the if the, there were any additional challenges installing this exhibition um, brought on by the pandemic? Yes, yeah, so as you might imagine, the, the works are, some of the small works are sort of fairly easy to place. The big comb pieces take quite a few hands to hang them securely. And so we've had to be very careful about scheduling um, a certain number of people. We are all double masked. I'm obviously in my office with the door closed right now, but otherwise we are all double masked and um, to the greatest degree po possible maintaining social distancing um, in order to get these safely installed. But um, it's, the galleries are looking incredible. And so, although it's been taking us a little bit longer to get this work done, it's been worth it. And I think the final result will delight everyone who is able to come to the museum. Great. Uh, does anyone else have any questions to pop into the chat? Please um, do so. Otherwise, um, I do want to invite you, please, if you would like to send any feedback or requests for future programs, uh, we'll post my email in the chat and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're always looking for fun and new ideas that you would find enjoyable. And do remember for those of you who are local, we're reopening and you can find our information about um, reserving tickets on the website. And we hope to see you at the museum if you feel comfortable coming. And otherwise, we'll continue to offer plenty of virtual programming in order to keep you all engaged. Uh, we do have a question from Rebecca. What does Sonia Clark teach at Amherst? Thanks for your question, Rebecca. She is professor of art and art history. And she was at Virginia uh, Commonwealth University, as I mentioned, I think for more than a decade, maybe 11 years, um, and loved her position there. But she remembered Amherst, her alma mater, so fondly. Uh, when, they, when they called her a couple of years back to invite her to be a professor there, she heeded the call. And so she's living in Western Massachusetts now. Um, and has been, um, uh, has been there actually, I think for the last year, I don't think she's been able to travel, which is tough for her because she's definitely a globe trotter um, and likes to be out and about. Um, but yes, she teaches art and art history because she won't surprise you is also a wonderful historian as well. Susan asks, what do you think the public reception will look like for this exhibition? I think, so I think the, 
this, I think there are, there's sort of a thrill about the technique and I think folks are gonna come in and maybe see those, those early works with all of that sort of handwork and so forth. Um, and be thrilled by the technique and the materials. And it's, it's very, it feels very personal and very poignant. And I think that um, that certainly carries through to the political works too, in terms of the handwork. But yes, the, the later works are, they feel very, very current. And I really expect that they will raise conversations in the galleries among visitors, folks who see our online exhibition, which we're putting the finishing touches on right now, for those of you who don't feel comfortable coming to the museum. Yes, there'll be some conversations about everything that we have been through as a nation, not only for the past year, but obviously the centuries preceding it. So I expect lively conversation and that's precisely why Sonia makes these works. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful question from Lisa asking if you could please talk about the history and process by which Nimwa discovered Sonia Clark and her work. So Sonia is someone that I have been following as a curator for probably, more than more than 10 years. I certainly knew her before I came to Nimwa, but the catalyst for this particular exhibition in this particular place was that we received a gift of four works by Sonia about, I'm gonna say it was about eight years ago. And I really just, it was, I felt like the planets had aligned. And so I really wanted to pursue an exhibition and specifically a mid-career survey, which she has not had to this point. She's had a ton of shows. She's had, I think, over 400 exhibitions around the world, but they've all focused on the combs or the hair or the flags. It's been sort of, you know, different themes and different topics. And I really wanted to present a holistic look at her career. Um, so it's been sort of uh, something that I've been nurturing for many years. And as Christina said, we had hoped to present it beginning last year and had to delay it because of the pandemic, but we're so thrilled to be able to present it now. Elaine mentions, uh her communal prayers project? Yes, the Beaded Prayers Project, which was presented by our, our wonderful colleagues over at the Textile Museum just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and Sonia was here in town, I think, to work with that. That's a wonderful and ongoing project um, that involves you and me and, and a lot of other participants sort of creating little um, kind of totems or little, um, not totems, but like a little talisman, a little packet um, with, with some material and some beads and sort of you know, imbuing it with, with your prayer, whatever that might be. And that's communal, expanding. I'm trying to think how many people have been involved with that. It's in the thousands at this point. But that was a wonderful show that was presented here in DC just a couple of years ago. Alva asks, what is Sonia working on now? So let's see, she definitely um, is still sort of looking at that monumental fragment idea, this I working on the truce flag. So that is ongoing work. She's returning to Combs. Um, I've seen a little glimpse into her studio and a couple of Zoom calls. She's been wrapping combs, the spines of combs, um, with sort of really colorful patterns. And um, I don't think she wants me to say precisely what the project is, but there's a book that inspires her greatly. And she is thinking about sort of color as it relates to that novel. Um, and so I think that's an upcoming project that she's really excited about. Again, that interface always with past artists, um, uh, contemporary artists of hers, she really sort of ties in so closely to her community in order to find material and inspiration. So I love that cross-pollination she's always looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Shannon, for the post about the Prayer Packet Project at Crystal Bridges. Um, Carol asks, does she produce all of these pieces by herself? It's a good question. And um, she does do a lot of it, but she has a, a longtime studio assistant um, who is still based in Richmond, um, who does sort of help her. So if you think about a piece like the Madame C.J. Walker tapestry, that really big hanging piece, it's easy enough for Sonia to say, okay, I need 28 squares where all of the teeth are clipped out, right? I need a, an area of light. And so she can hand those off to that studio assistant and, um, and have her sort of clip out those teeth. Or if there's sort of some stitching that she needs some help with, she, she, might, she might ask her to assist with that. But really very little. It's mostly Sonia, again, with just some help on sort of the more repetitive tasks. Okay. Are there any, anything um, more you could tell us about the catalog, Katie? The catalog is so, so beautiful. I should have brought my copy um, uh, in to sort of hold it up to you. It's, 
the most substantial book I think we produced since I've been at the museum in terms of the number of pages. Um, we have an extended and marvelous interview with Sonia uh, conducted by Nell Painter, herself a wonderful artist and historian. Um, there are three new essays by wonderful um, cultural critics, art historians, and so forth. Every single work in the show is illustrated in full color, gets its own page. Um, it's, it's, oh, and we commissioned a poem, a gorgeous poem by Nikki Finney, who is tremendous, um, just for Sonia, just for Tatter Bristle Men, just for this project. So the book is a real, a real gem, um, really, really beautiful. And we're really incredibly proud of it. So if you're if you're a bibliophile and you like to have sort of books on the shelf that you can refer to again and again, I hope you'll look at our catalog. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that concludes questions. I'm going slowly. Jay asks, how did the title of the exhibition come about? So Sonia titled it herself. Um, and I, I, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking that because I wanna make clear, Sonia has been our partner in this project from the get-go. So the minute that we got her to agree to the scope of the project and the timeline, she's been our partner. We go back and forth about almost every sort of element of it, including the title. I was coming up with sort of some corny things that were punning on hair. And of course she's like, Katie, just settle down. Um, mm -hmm. And she came up with something much more poetic and tatter bristling men. I think if you think about, about um, her process, the sort of um, focus on textiles and fiber techniques and so forth, that sort of works um, sort of literally with the title, tatter, bristling, mending. But of course it's meant to be figurative too. And it's meant to reflect on the moment in time in which we find ourselves where we have, we have been tattered. There are people who are always bristling and things are sort of upsetting, but how do we mend? How do we find the common ground? And how can her work sort of help us get there? I really think that's what she had in mind. Okay, well, thank you again so much everyone hold on belinda asks will sonia be doing any performances during the nimwa exhibition other than i guess the yeah i mean i showed unraveling and of course our hope in choosing it for the exhibition was to possibly have a performance this was obviously when we were first planning the project now a couple of years ago um because she is sort of having to stay put in amherst um uh, in order to for, for her own health and obviously for the health of her students uh, we're not going to be able to activate that piece and she will not be doing any in-person performances here. My dearest wish, as you might imagine, is that at some point she will feel free to come to Washington and see the exhibition. Um, it's a little bit heartbreaking for us that she's not here for sort of the opening and that, you know, things sort of can't be as they normally are. But um, I know she's going to make every effort to sort of uh, hopefully find a time when she feels safe and secure to be able to come down and view it. Uh, we are making a film of the galleries. I do want to say that too. That is going to be in process. We have to wait until we're all finished before we bring the filmmaker in. But we wanted to give Sonia and any visitor or guest um, or supporter of the museum who's interested in the show, but for whatever reason can't come in person to sort of get a feel for the space, to sort of see the difference between those enormous corn comb pieces and that little tiny spool of gold, for example. I mean, I, th I think sort of seeing a moving image of that will help you get a feel for her, her shifts in scale um, um, much better. So that is forthcoming. Um, but yes, I wish she were going to be here in person, but we don't have plans at the moment. Okay. Um, so we have a very important question from Elva. She wants to know about the lovely brooch you're wearing. Well, El Elva knows that I have an entire wardrobe of my flower pins. It's kind of my my signature since I'm not so much a necklace person. But thank you, Elva. Love you. Um, and uh, yes, one one of several. And uh, I do I do I do adore them. They have become a bit of a signature. I'm, I'm proud to say. Well, everyone, thank you so very much for joining us today. We're we're just so delighted that we can be opening this exhibition at all. So um, so grateful to you all and look forward to hearing from you and seeing you uh, sooner rather than later. Take good care. Thanks everyone. Bye.